Hello and welcome to this episode of the Bronte Network and today we shall be looking at Emily Bronte, some of her works and her life. <laughs> in the earth and fifteen wild Decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering. These lines written in 1846 for Emily Bronte's poem Remembrance are probably some of her most famous pieces of verse and prove that before Emily was a novelist she was indeed a very I think, successful poet, although successful in the quality of her verse rather than the quantity sold, as the collection that Emily and her sisters produced in 1846, called Poems by Cura, Ellis and Acton Bell, infamously only sold two copies. But anyway, I digress. Within these lines from Remembrance, I think you can see the foundations of the novel she would go on to write a year later. We get the sense of loss, of death, of things lingering on from behind, from beyond the grave. And it becomes clear from these lines how some of her early reviewers criticised her for being morbid and coarse. Indeed, throughout the entire works of the Brontes, we can see a preoccupation with death, which... I mean, it's hardly surprising considering that death was so much among their lives. Very little is actually known about Emily Bronte's life, and this is partly down to the fact that she was no great writer of letters. Unlike her sister Charlotte, who wrote hundreds of letters to her best friend Ellen Nussey and to her other friend Mary Taylor, Emily wrote very few letters indeed. And to give a little indication of why, we have one of her letters here that she wrote to Ellen Nussey in May 1843. All here are in good health, so was Anne according to the last accounts. The holy days will be here in a week or two, and then, if she be willing, I will get her to write you a proper letter, a feat that I have never performed. With love and good wishes, E.J. Bronte. I think that the last paragraph of this letter is particularly telling when Emily says that writing a full letter is a feat she has never performed, which consequently means that there is very little surviving record of Emily Bronte's thoughts and conversations with other people, part of the reason that she remains such a mysterious and elusive figure. Another reason that Emily is so hard to understand to a modern reader is the thick layers of myth that surround her life. Part of this comes, unsurprisingly, from Charlotte Bronte herself. Having lost all of her sisters by the time the 1850s marched in, Charlotte was keen to challenge the negative critical reception that had surrounded Anne and Emily's lives. So she published as accompanying the second edition of Wuthering Heights, her own new preface, in which she writes, The immature but very real powers revealed in Wuthering Heights were scarcely recognised. Its import and nature were misunderstood. The identity of its author was misrepresented. It was said that it was an earlier and ruder attempt of the same pen which had produced Jane Eyre. Unjust and grievous error. She then goes on to write, Stronger than a man, simpler than a child, her nature stood alone. The awful point was that while full of ruth for others, on herself she had no pity. The spirit was inexorable to the flesh, from the trembling hand, the unnerved limbs, the faded eyes, the same service was exacted as they had rendered in health. To stand by and witness this, and not dare to remonstrate, was a pain no words can render. So I think that Charlotte is doing two rather interesting things within this short preface. Firstly, she is very obviously distancing herself from Wuthering Heights and attacking the reviewers and critics who suggested that they were written by the same hand. And secondly, she is offering an insight into Emily Bronte's nature and how she could have come to write what was considered at the time such a coarse and shocking a book as Wuthering Heights. She suggests that while she had a masculine and manly nature, something that Charlotte picks up on in her later novel Shirley, with Shirley allegedly based on Emily Bronte, 
We also get the suggestion that Emily was childlike, that she didn't know what she was writing. It is important to remember that Charlotte was writing this amongst the grief for the, her lost two sisters, and therefore she was incredibly keen not to do them any further critical damage, but in fact to suggest their innocence, their virtue, and crucially their morality in the face of very unsavoury reviews. So while Charlotte has done quite a lot to shape our subsequent understandings of Emily, I think it's important not to be too harsh on her and to recognise the ulterior motives for what she was doing. One of the ways I would like to criticise Charlotte Bronte's claim that Emily Bronte didn't know what she was doing when she wrote Wuthering Heights was through this rather brilliant early 20th century essay by C.P. Sanger called The Structure of Wuthering Heights. In this essay, Sanger goes through the key dates of Wuthering Heights and proves that despite the complexities of the plot, there is a clear timeline that occurs within the novel, with all of the major events being traceable to not only specific months, but in most cases specific days of specific months of specific years, which goes to prove that far from not knowing what she was doing, Emily Bronte had created an incredibly elaborate system of chronology surrounding her text. Claire Harmon has recently written that Emily Bronte might have had Asperger's syndrome to account for the fact that she was so socially awkward and hated being in the company of others. But if this is true, it would also go some way to suggest how she had such a clear and focused understanding and grasp of dates and numbers. But yet there is further cloud that surrounds Emily Bronte in the form of her alleged mysticism. And Lucasta Miller traces this back to this very book. And I don't know if you can see, but this is May Sinclair's The Three Brontes, which dates from 1911. And in it, May Sinclair writes, Love of life and passionate adoration of the earth, adoration and passion fiercer than any pagan knew, burns in Wuthering Heights. And if that were all, it would be impossible to say whether her mysticism or her paganism most revealed the soul of Emily Bronte. So what May Sinclair is suggesting is that Emily Bronte was William Blake-like, a mystic figure who saw God on Earth. And certainly if you look within her poems, you can find evidence for this view. For example, in High Waving Heather, in which Emily Bronte writes, Earth rising to heaven and heaven descending, man's spirit away from its drear dungeon sending, bursting the fetters and breaking the bars. I mean, this poem is unquestionably about man's ability to find divinity on earth and within nature. And indeed, a similar moment can be seen within Wuthering Heights. The scene I'm referring to is when Nellie and the older Catherine are talking together in the kitchen. And Cathy says... If I were to go to heaven, Nelly, I should be extremely miserable. Because you're not fit to go there, I answered. All sinners would be miserable in heaven. But it is not for that. I dreamt once that I was there. I tell you, I won't hearken to your dreams, Miss Catherine. I'll go to bed, I interrupted again. She laughed and held me down, for I made a motion to leave my chair. This is nothing, cried she. I was only going to say that heaven did not seem to be my home, and I broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth, and the angels were so angry that they flung me out into the middle of the heath on top of Wuthering Heights, where I woke sobbing for joy. That will do to explain my secret. Again, we see a breakdown between earth and heaven, with, with heaven, for Cathy at least, existing within the landscape of the West Yorkshire Moors. We also get a sense of a character who was able to visualise heaven, albeit in dream form only. However, as Lucasta Miller highlights, it's important to remember that many of the examples that are used by subsequent biographers and critics as evidence for Emily Bronte's purported mysticism are in fact Gondol poems, Gondol being one of the fictional lands that the Bronte children concocted. These texts were set in a fictional and highly fantastical land it would be simply erroneous to view them as comments on, on the Bronte's own lives and feelings. Furthermore, Lucasta Miller highlights the significance of mysticism within the early to mid-19th century 
and suggests that its connotations were primarily negative. In contrast, in the early 20th century, the time in which May Sinclair was writing, there was a resurgence in mysticism. So whilst I'm certainly not going to say that Emily Bronte was categorically not a mystic, I would just, like Lucasta Miller, urge caution with this term and recommend returning to the text itself to see what evidence can be found to support this view, rather than just taking it as a red fact. And unfortunately, this huge body of critical work has surrounded Emily Bronte in a thick fog that is very hard to break through to find the grains of truth that lie behind it. What we do know about Emily Bronte are some of the key elements of her nature and temperament. She was an incredibly fiery individual, prone to fits of frustration, and who hated leaving home, and who, while she was sent to work at Roe Head, pined away until she had to be sent home for fear for her life. Claire Harmon has suggested that this might be down to the fact that every time one of her sisters left home, um, she's talking about Elizabeth and Mariah here, the oldest members of the Bronte family, that they died, leaving in her head the impression that to leave home was to never return. And I think this is certainly an interesting and plausible idea. The other thing we know about Emily Bronte is her treatment of animals, something that I've discussed in one of my other videos, which you can find a link to here. The one thing I really love about Emily Bronte is the fact that, and this is my opinion rather than a critical fact, that I feel that she genuinely tried to understand everybody and was completely unjudgmental. Although she struggled with human interactions, she nevertheless never lost her faith in humanity and whilst humanity is very prone to sin and get things wrong, Emily Bronte understood this as an essential part of being human. As she writes, do I despise the timid deer? Just because the deer is frightened and afraid, it doesn't make it something to be hated and despised. And I think that, in my, again, this is only my opinion, but Emily Bronte carried this philosophy to all elements of her life and writing. And it's one of the reasons that Wuthering Heights is the book it is. Although there are terrible atrocities, cruelties, betrayals and deceit that go on within this text, we're encouraged to take a step back. And partly this is through the narration techniques that we're hearing the story through Nellie and through Lockwood. So we are too removed from the actual events of the novel, but I think it is also partly down to Emily Bronte's own beliefs that to take a step back and to try and view the actions of others impartially, and as I say, I think, in my opinion, this is what makes her such a profound and universally appreciated writer today.